Okay, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Mary Ann Murphy Zarzan. I'm the director of the Creative Writing Program here, and I'd just like to welcome you and thank you for joining us today, faculty, staff, students, administrators, and especially any relatives or friends who've traveled from a distance. First, we extend our sincere thanks to Dr. Emily Deaver, organizer of the SMSU Undergraduate Research Conference, as well as the originator, for this opportunity to have this year's senior portfolio reading as part of the stellar campus event. Uh, we would also like to thank Dr. Neil Smith, chair of the English department for his strong leadership and to all my colleagues in the department, uh, faculty who have challenged and nurtured our student writers. It's an honor to serve with such outstanding professors. Thanks also to Leanne Tig, our administrative assistant who always keeps the English department on track with her excellent organizational skills and great sense of humor. And finally, congratulations and thanks to our senior, three senior creative writing students who will be reading today, DC Crowell, Jess Rockman, and Stephanie Wisdom for their hard work and dedication to the craft of writing. In their writing, they take on difficult and challenging themes and topics, handle them with depth, gravitas, humor, and insight, using the writing skills that they've honed through their hard work and dedication to learning their craft. As a graduation requirement, all SMSU creative writing students produce a senior portfolio of their best work and present their work at a senior portfolio reading. Today, each writer will read for 15 minutes, and they will each introduce each other. Please hold your applause until the end of each student's reading. Please take a moment now to silence all your electronic devices. And here is Jess Rockman. I'll be introducing Stephanie Wisdom today. Stephanie was born in Panama City, Panama and currently lives here in Marshall. After graduation, she hopes to begin a career with graphic design or illustration, but she also enjoys her job now as a data specialist for Head Start. Ideally, she wants to create an organization that can be the foundation people need to pull themselves back up and into a life that they truly want. She wants to help create opportunities for low-income families and individuals to learn how to better themselves in whatever ways they need. I have known Stephanie for a couple of years now. She was always so quiet and shy in class, but once I got to know her, I realized she was a very talented writer and artist with many of the same very nerdy hobbies as me. Um, her work often speaks for her. She's able to put a lot of personal history on the page to draw the reader in, which takes courage and skill. So I'm proud to introduce my friend and classmate, Stephanie Wisdom. Thank you for that, Jess. Um, today I'll be reading a short story that I put together that's a mix of fiction, um, my own experiences in Panama with my family, and um, lo folk tale stories from my mom and just kind of, they were kind of passed down. <clears throat> uh, the story, or the title is The Stone Door. I watched the battered gray truck struggle through the dried clay ruts in the road as it headed back to town. Meet me, the remaining passengers in the rear lurched back and forth, their hands gripped tight to the metal frame. I watched them until they were hidden from sight by the lush jungle. Susan, it's time to go. I turned to see Manuel waving me over. After adjusting my yellow pack, I jogged to where everyone was gathered. Two guides, a married couple named Martha and Joseph, and Manuel. One of the guides, Victor, a short Latino man in ragged clothing and tall rubber boots, was giving instructions in Spanish. He explained to us that the next part of our journey would be walking. They'd take any luggage they didn't want to carry with us ahead by canoe to the village. After they dropped off our luggage, they'd come back up and meet us and take us the rest of the way on the river. I touched Manuel's shoulder. How do we know where to meet them? Manuel turned back to the guides conveying my message. He say the road is straight. To where we go is not hard to find. We meet at old school, not used anymore. 
Not many schools out here. Once they finished loading the luggage, they pushed off and waved, drifting down the Panama River. The four of us turned back to the road, following it to a stream that separated the road, creating a large gap. It's no wonder cars won't go any further. Manuel suggested we take our shoes off while crossing, otherwise they might get washed away. We sloshed through the waist-high water, fighting the pull of the current. Once we reached the shore, we continued down the road. The tropical heat made it feel like time was passing so slowly. Our faces were covered in layers of sweat, our hair matted to our face. I regretted not putting my pack in the canoe. The backside of my shirt stuck to my skin. This heat is unbearable, Martha said. I need to rest. She walked to the side of the road, leaning against a coconut tree. Everyone found their own trees to rest on. Martha and Joseph wore the signature fanny pack over safari as clothing, com complete with tennis shoes, though Joseph had opted for rubber boots like everyone else. The only things Martha and Joseph had uttered the entire trip were grumbles, complaints, and words of regret. Apparently, they didn't think the trip would be hot, exhausting, or buggy. Who knows? Maybe they just like to complain for the sake of complaining. I fixed my ponytail and baseball cap before taking a few drinks from my water bottle. A warm breeze came through, rustling the trees. I closed my eyes, listening to the noises around us. It sounded like a cacophony of chattering birds, insects, and amphibians. We should keep going, Manuel stood up. No telling how long they wait for us. Martha grumbled but complied. She followed the rest of us back to the road, pulling Joseph along with her. A few hours and some missing shoes later, we arrived at what looked like an abandoned school. It was just a concrete floor with a tin roof held up by wooden beams. There were a few benches beneath the roof, so we all headed toward them. When we reached the concrete, I was reminded of a grumpy Martha with sounds that resembled a duck walking on a smooth surface. Martha refused to wear rubber boots like the rest of us and would not take her shoes off, so she lost them in the goop. The roads here were mud with horse manure mixed, mixed in since you either walked or rode a horse. With all the rain they got, it could be pretty slimy. So the roads ended up a mix of squishy and hard, littered with holes from horse hooves. As expected, Martha found a few extra juicy spots. In the end, she lost both her shoes and came away with her legs caked in the mixture up to her knees. Slap, 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 slap. I did my best to refrain from laughing since Martha was snappy right now. I sat down on the bench next to Manuel drinking a bit more of my water. Light glimmered from the sun's rays dancing over the roaring river. My thoughts drifted to a story I heard from my mother about my abuelo. It was late at night when he saw a light on the road. There was no one there, it was just floating. The light started to move down the road. Puzzled, abuelo decided to follow it. The light reached a cemetery and went inside. Abuelo was afraid and would follow no further. My mother said locals are afraid because they believe there are many evil spirits lurking. They believe lights, like the one my abuelo followed, are spirits that try to lure people to join them in their graves. I'm not sure how long we waited, but our guides came to meet us, leading us to the canoes. We arrived at the village, Boca de Tulu, as sundown neared. Victor got out of the canoe, pulling it to the shore. The family that was hosting us, the Rangels, were there to welcome us. They offered to carry whatever we needed help with and guided us up the steep river bank. Despite the rocks they'd placed for footing, it was still a bit slippery. The villagers watched us from the fence as we carried our things inside. With what little light was left, 
I could see grass huts across the way. Some were small, while others were a bit larger. I looked around the room. <clears throat> I looked around the home we were staying in. It was painted a pale yellow, and the walls were all cement, with the exception of spaces for the wooden doors and windows. Several sheets of tin covered the top of the home. Manuel noticed me looking around. They make good money. They sell things to travelers. What do they sell? Medicine, snacks, drinks, other things. Popular treat is boli. What's boli? Is cold and sweet, good for hot days. Manuel walked over to the kitchen, beckoning me to follow. Isidra, one of our hosts, had prepared a small dinner for us. Tamales, Panamanian rice, and chicken. They even let us have some boli on the house, although it was just a fruit juice popsicle. We all went to bed with full stomachs. We woke at 4 a.m. Today, we'd make the trek to a nearby cave. Based on how yesterday went, I expected Martha and Joseph to stay behind. Surprisingly, they were enthusiastic to go. We went outside to where the guides were waiting for us. They explained we would go by horse until we reached the rainforest. It would be too dense and too dangerous to bring the horses with us. Victor warned us he would not enter the cave. He'd take us there and back, but that's it. Manuel, why won't they go inside? I asked. Manuel spoke with Victor for a few moments before turning back to me. He say it's dangerous. The door is heavy stone. People say if you go in, it trap you inside. Some have found bones from people. They are afraid. Skeptical, I scrunched my eyebrows. That doesn't make sense. A stone that big can't move on its own. Manuel just shrugged, leaving me to my thoughts. After choosing who would double up on which horse, we waved goodbye and headed into the thick mist surrounding the village. We made it to the edge of the rainforest and had left the horses behind. We'd been trekking for an hour or so when the guides stopped. They told, uh, told us we needed to be careful in this next area. To get to the cave we wanted to see, we needed to go through this tunnel first. What's the big deal? It's just a tunnel, Martha spat. After Manuel translated, he responded, he say we need to be careful because it's very dark. There are bats also, so cannot use much light. Martha stiffened. She looked a little pale, but didn't say anything more. Did she really think nothing lived inside? Did she think they were just empty, hollowed out rocks? I sighed and rolled my eyes. Before we went in, Victor told us to cover our mouths with our hands, otherwise a bat may fly in. Once inside, we formed a line with Victor leading the way and the other guide at the back. They each had a light, but it was still pitch black. The sound of fluttering wings echoed throughout the cave. We walked through the cave slowly, following the guide with our hands over our mouths. The fluttering grew louder, then there were screeches. As we continued forward, I felt what I imagined were bat wings grazing my face. Occasionally, bats colliding into my face completely. Martha started screaming. No, stop it, leave me alone. The guide behind her urged her forward but she continued to scream and sob. Joseph had to pull her along. I don't think she would have moved on her own. When we emerged, we saw we were standing near a small pool of water, a stream emptying into it. Following the water upstream led us to a small waterfall about three feet high. Since there were plenty of dry rocks, Victor suggested we rest there. One of them would go ahead and make a safe path. He returned a few minutes later, motioning for us to follow. After a bit of trekking, we arrived at the cave. 
The entrance alone was three or four times my height. The rock face shrouded in vines and flowers. Just as the story said, there was a large stone beneath the entrance. We stepped forward, taking in every detail. I'm not going. We stay here, Victor said. I glanced back at our guides and again to the cave. What's there to be afraid of? It would be such a shame to come all this way and not at least take a look. Victor stood a distance away from us, still as stone, as if the presence of the cave alone was keeping him there. That's fine. Whoever wants to stay can stay. I'm going in, though. Well, I'm going too, then, Martha said. I'm not going to be outdone by this tomboy. I raised my eyebrows, throwing my hands in the air. I turned around and headed into the cave with Manuel, Martha, and Joseph following behind me. It was so dark inside, it seemed to swallow our lights. Even though we all had one, they were like distant stars instead of the beacons they were supposed to be. The deeper we went, the cooler the air became. Suzanne, we should leave. There are bad things here. I ignored Manuel, curiosity driving me. After rounding a corner, we came upon a large open area. There were a few passages, too. We fanned out to explore the room. Martha was the first to discover something. Oh my gosh, look at this. We followed her voice, and on the wall above her were clusters of strange, primitive drawings, like hieroglyphs. I panned my flashlight around. Most of them seemed to be on the ceiling, but there were some lower on the walls as well. We continued to walk around the room, looking for more. Something glimmered down one of the passages. I peeked in and saw a floating light. It hovered there before floating down the hallway. Transfixed, I began to follow it into the tunnel. Martha screamed, breaking the trance. I ran to where Martha was crumpled on the ground. She was sobbing. Joseph was trying to calm her. What's wrong? Martha could only point her shaky finger. I followed the direction she pointed. On the ground, there were bones mixed in with rubble, coated in dust. I reached into my knapsack, pulling out my canvas toolkit. I crouched down next to the pile, brushing away the rubble. Some of the bones were broken, but after piecing one together, I realized it looked like a femur bone from a human. I dug through the rubble, looking for more evidence. A few moments later, I made my conclusion that these were human bones. I'd found a human skull missing pieces of its cranium and its jaw. Suzanne, please, we must go now, Manuel urged, pulling at my arm. Look, Joseph shouted, pointing behind us. Manuel and I spun around to see a beautiful deer 10 feet away. It stood there, looking at us. It seemed so unreal, as if it was glowing. Suzanne, I blinked. The deer was gone. We must go now. I have bad feeling, Manuel shouted. Manuel pulled me along, not waiting for a response. Joseph carried Martha, following us through the cave to the entrance. We stumbled out of the cave and collapsed into the stream. Our guides ran to us. They were both talking so fast. They say scared for us, bad feelings, chills, said Manuel. I snapped. Do they really believe a large stone like that could move on its own? I pointed at the large stone door. Stunned, I walked back toward the cave in silence. Suzanne, what are you doing? Get away from there. I ran my hands over the rough stone, looking around trying to understand what had just happened. The opening we'd just come through was gone. 
the large stone had moved, blocking off the entrance. <laughs> and next we'll have DC Kroll, who was raised here in Marshall and attended Marshall Senior High School. She's double majoring in creative writing and teaching English as a second language. I haven't known Danny very long, but between her writing, the classes we've had together, and outside of class, I've seen Danny's writing grow exponentially. She's funny, she's fearless, and a great inspiration. Thank you so much for that, Stephanie. All right, so this first one I've got for you, I have a bunch of poetry and then an excerpt from a creative nonfiction story I wrote. This first poem I have for you today is called Toadstone. It, is, uh, it was a part of a assignment where we had to research a topic and I chose the Salem Witch Trials. So I kind of went off on that a little bit in my own creative poetic way. So, Toadstone. I stumble and pull a net full of emerald limbs, jumping and croaking fresh from the marshes. I walk towards a patch of evergreen, steering clear of the villagers' harsh gazes and bitter whispers. Mama said, come back quick. I pushed through the pine and see our little cottage amidst a halo of yellow wildflowers. I watch Mama's nimble hands grab each jade body, place them on a red cloth, like always. I stare as she grips each slimy creature and fishes out a dark little stone from their foreheads. It looks like a magic trick. I hold the bowl of toadstones next to Mama. She grabs each pebble, transforms them into rings, necklaces, brooches. I remember Mama telling me, these save people, heal them from fits of shaking. But some villagers don't like that, she said. I listened to Mama tell stories of villagers not liking things they didn't understand, couldn't see, but we have to make a living. I pack away her work in a small cushioned box. Take these to town tomorrow, dear. I wake to Mama's voice mixed with a murmur of men, too many footsteps in our home and a slammed door. I follow their chant through the trees, back to the lake. Witch, witch, witch. I peered through overgrown brush as Mama's tied up with rope, heaved into the lake. Only bubbles escape the surface. I run to the edge of the water. The men see she doesn't float. All walk back to the village. I find one of our snares nearby. I stumble and pull a net, fresh from the marshes. This next one I've got for you is called Hate Text. It is an imitation poem uh, based off of Carol Muskie Dukes' Hate Mail. She wrote a poem about someone sending her a piece of very angry mail about her artwork. And so I kind of took a little spin off of that. Uh, the language is a little uh, PG-13, so parental guidance. Uh, so, so, hate text. You're a slut, a dirty slut. Think people want you, even your mom doesn't want you. She wanted a good girl, not those spread legs that welcome any man. You think those men will fill the hole your father left? No. They're going to leave that child all alone again. You brought this on yourself. Wearing clothes that say yes when your mouth says no, you're the reason women don't get to answer. And men feel like victims because your body doesn't give them an option. I hate you. Oops, just kidding, girl. I didn't mean any of that. Autocorrect is a bitch, a filthy bitch. 
This next poem I have for you is called A Peer Helper for Isabella Garcia. A uh, peer helper is something in high school where they're paired up with a younger student in middle school or elementary school, kind of just hang out with them, talk with them, play games and stuff like that. And this was my experience with that. A peer helper for Isabella Garcia. An 11 year old girl with wide chestnut eyes, a hard shell and baggage I couldn't handle. She hid behind games of checkers, craft projects, and poor English. Yet when words came, they told of her world. Spoke of her home with her tia, itio, and cousins, made to sleep on a cot in the living room. Spoke of her madre, living in California, saving her wages. Hadn't seen her for three years spoke of her brother on the two-year anniversary of his death. Drive-by shootings common in Uruguay. But then her story stopped when she and her family ran from the deportation police. I was told, go back to class. My next piece is called Prep Time. Uh, if any of you don't know, I am also much of a cook. And so I wanted to bring food into one of my poems. Prep time. Like a slab of meat, I started out organic, natural. But now, poked and prodded, I'm just right. Transformed with recipes to make men drool. Covered with spices to turn me exotic. Basted with oil to see me shine. Simmered in Merlot to give me an aroma. Laid out on the grill, watch me shrink. Like a slab of meat, but they call me fine cuisine. My next <clears throat> poetry, <clears throat> sorry, uh, is actually my only form poetry for you today. Uh, it is in Villanelle form. Uh, sorry. God. Um, <coughs> and um, so this repeats quite a lot. Uh, there is repetition and some rhyme in there. So if you're thinking you're hearing the same thing, it's on purpose. So millennials speak now. We are called the 9-11 generation. Two towers were downed and became our definition. Our attackers started that mission, but the label turned around. We are called the 9-11 generation. Did something get lost in translation? The boomers were at the mound, yet it became our definition. We didn't create the frustration or push the East into the ground. We are called the 9-11 generation. This was once called a great nation, yet terror wins one round and it became our definition. We were just coming into fruition and now we are found. We are called the 9-11 generation, but it is not our definition. So that's it with my poetry. And so now I have an excerpt from a creative nonfiction I wrote. It is about a time in high school when I went to Spain with a class and I lived with a host family and it was a little bit of an interesting experience for me. Um, and I was living with this family that my host sister Carolina did not pay that much attention to me. She mainly talked to her boyfriend the whole time. Uh, and I was kind of taken on a side quest with her mom and her mom I never quite got her name and with my terrible Spanish I still can't quite ask so in here I called her Senora Sapo which means Mrs. Toad because she kind of looked like it so that was uh, but you know okay so so I'm starting in page three of my story actually Senora Sapo and I continued walking, saying nothing to each other until we reached a house that had a front patio. All of the house was tan, including the owner. The owner. 
He was a fairly short and thin man with dark hair and eyes. When he came closer to greet us, I could see the leathery texture of his skin and lines etched in around his face. A smirk tried to stretch itself across the top material. Hello there, he smiled at me, showing his overly white teeth. He then directed us into his house as I was still trying to process that he just spoke English. Within minutes of the two of them chattering to each other, Senora Sapo walked right back out the door without saying a word to me. It's all right, she just has some errands to run, he said to my panic-stricken face. Then there was silence between us as I stood in the doorway, unsure of where to go. He waved for me to follow through a white hallway. I followed him, feeling like a dog with its tail between its legs. We entered a large room with a wooden dining table with four chairs. Behind that, several blue couches surrounding a flat screen TV. On one of the couches, a dark face peeped through a bundle of blankets. That's my wife. You'll have to excuse her. She's sick. He gestured at the pile as a little hand sprouted out. Here, I'll show you something. We walked into an apartment-sized kitchen. He grabbed a pan and poured a decent amount of oil in it. I stood in a corner, trying to plan my escape from that country for the second time in those two weeks. I'm going to show you how to make a recipe that's been passed down my family for generations. Homemade donuts. And it began. Flour, sugar, a pinch of lemon zest. Fry and flip, repeat. It felt like an hour before he finished with all the donut batter. As he cooked, he was telling a story about his third Moroccan wife, the woman amongst the blankets. But I didn't care to listen. I stood there in the corner of the kitchen, tears begging to be released and question questions racing through my mind. Why was I dumped here? Did she just want to get rid of me? Did she leave to go yell at Carolina? Are they either of them going to come back for me? Am I stuck here in Spain forever? The entire trip was falling into pieces around me. A part of me wanted to hear a phone ring for the caller to say there was a mistake. Danny needs to leave. Or that this is negligence and everyone is going to be arrested. Heck, I prayed it would be my father turning into Liam Neeson and saying, I will find you and I will kill you. <laughs> An hour later, Carolina and her mom came back, yelling at each other. We all sat down around a dining table. Those three talked, turning to Leatherman for advice, while his wife brought me some Nestle chocolate milk and a big plate full of fresh donuts. She gestured for me to eat, and I did so reluctantly. With all of this fighting around me, my appetite wasn't quite there. It didn't help that the donuts tasted like chalk and left a pasty film on my teeth. Amidst the yelling, I heard my name a few times, but I refused to look at the bickering group. Then at some point in the argument, Carolina rolled her eyes, grabbed my arm, and stormed out of the leather man's home. We headed straight to a hookah bar. So that's all I've got for you today. <clears throat> I think I actually forgot to say the title of my last piece. Um, it's called Donuts in El Monte. So um, the next uh, lady coming up for you here today is, uh, the next writer is coming up here for you today is Jess Rockman. She's from Centerville, Minnesota, attending, and she attended Centennial High School in Circle Pines. She's a creative writing slash literature major here at SMSU and will actually be finishing up her degree this semester. She plans to work and save up money in order to attend graduate school in 2017 to get her master's of fine arts degree in creative writing. <clears throat> Jess has been in nearly all of my creative writing classes. Uh, we've served as tutors together at the Writing Center and have worked together in the English Club as well. Throughout my time with Jess, I've been constantly impressed by the skill and effort she puts into every one of her pieces. She's one of the most talented people that I've ever met. So with no further ado, here's Jess Rock. Thank you, Danny. 
My first piece is uh, flash fiction. It is called Warning Song, and it's about a sister having to take care of her younger siblings through an interesting endeavor. Maggie emptied the bathtub before going outside for Lemon's funeral. The water sucked noisily down the drain, the color of beer from Lemon's food pellets and droppings. The last thing to swirl away was a single brilliant yellow feather. She dried her hands on her jeans and went outside. Before she made it off the front porch, she turned on her heel and went back to grab the crumbling cigar box wrapped in silver duct tape off the kitchen counter. Lemon's cage sat on the front porch, still dripping, leaving a puddle on the faded wood. The kid stood solemnly beneath the paper birch, Kristen digging her red sneakers into the dirt, and Jacob with his hands held behind his back, like a tiny man rather than an 11-year-old boy. Mother lingered behind them, arms wrapped around her body, her blue sweater too light for the cold spring wind. The sun set behind them, the color of sorbet. Did you bring her? Kristen looked up at Maggie, corn silk hair blowing into her damp, red-rimmed eyes. Maggie held up the box and gave it a jostle. Right here, kid. Is the hole ready? Don't shake her, Kristen said, voice high and thin. It's a grave, not a hole, Jacob said, unclasping his hands. They were streaked in dirt, as were the thighs of his pants. Yeah, sure. Maggie squatted down. Jacob dug the hole too shallow, but Maggie just go out and fix it later after the kids went to bed, but before Dad got home from wherever the hell he ran off to. Chrissy, did you want to cover her up? Mother moved forward, a halting step like she was doing the hokey pokey. Don't let her get dirty, baby. I just did the whites. Maggie ignored her, handing Kristen a garden trowel caked with years of dirt. But Kristen didn't make a move to take it. So Maggie sighed and started piling dirt over the box. Do you want to say a few words? This was your idea. Kristen shrugged, little mouth set in a stern line. She was my birdie and I loved her. She sang nice songs. I'll miss her a lot. Me too, Jacob added solemnly, even though he had little to do with Kristen's prize canary, her birthday gift when she turned seven in August. Most of the time, the constant chirping annoyed him just as much as it annoyed Dad. Maggie looked up, shaking a stray blonde curl out of her eyes. Ma, do you want to say a few words for Lemon? Mother gave Maggie a pleading look before her face broke and she rolled her eyes. Oh, for heaven's sake, Maggie, it's a damn bird. Bury it already. Maggie licked her dry lips and pick up, picked up the trowel again. You should have kept your beak shut, you stupid thing, she said, and covered up the last of the box. But they're supposed to sing, Kristen said, hiccuping, tears running. She stuck a wood chip into the dirt at the head of the grave that read in black marker, Lemon Birdie, R.I.P. It would be gone with the rain in a week. Maggie nodded and stood up, brushing the dirt off her jeans. Let's go inside. Now I'll read two poems. Um, they are both about women who were victims of very violent and very sad crimes. The first is called John Bonet. Beauty more than bitterness makes the heart break. Sarah Teasdale. You were not slipped into the water like Moses in his basket when they put you down beneath those wooden stairs. No hope for you in the cold bulrushes of the basement. You exist in pictures now, draped in chiffon, sprays of white zinnias crowning your cloud of golden hair. In which shudder of time did we blink and lose you in the negatives? They praised your final act, little miss. The applause is deafening, though the stage is empty and the spotlight dimmed. Everyone wants a piece of your smile. The tickets sell fast for eight hours alone, faster than 10 fingers circling your lace-covered throat. But you never step out and greet the ones who paid to see you shine. You wouldn't find me in the auditorium, program crumpled in my fist. I'd bring you to the park while the sun sets. You'd wear blue jeans, a sweater with a kitten on the front, and pick dandelions and clover from the grass. 
when you'd present them to me like the richest reward, I'd leave the weeds in the dirt and take your tiny hand instead. My next one is called S'il vous plaît. You're all a bunch of feminists. I hate feminists. These were Mark Lapine's words as he entered a classroom in the École Polytechnique on December 6, 1989. In a rampage that lasted only 20 minutes, he murdered 14 women and injured 13 more, making it one of the largest mass murders in Montreal's history. Numbers can't explain him. There are no equations for rifles, for sweat, for shattered glass underfoot, or the piss scent of fear. Never had a woman's perfume on his hands or her hair tangled in his dirty sheets. It's what's on the inside that mattered, and he emptied it out onto the tile. Their hearts and skins, their scents, the copper of their bodies and their brains he never wanted. Smart girls know better than to get into bed with bad boys. But the smartest girls never learned how to duck fast enough, breathe through shredded lungs, or stay home sick from class. And the last piece I have for you today is an excerpt from a short story I wrote called The Blue Room. Um, pretty much the only thing you need to know is that it takes place in a small town uh, gay bar. And it is between, is an exchange between a professor and a student. Whatever's on tap, Jody, a male voice said from next to Izzy, and she startled, not realizing the stool next to hers was occupied. She looked up and then at her drink, focusing on the ice in the glass, the way it swirled with the chunks of fruit. Hello, Isabel, he said, quiet and polite. No need to be shy, I didn't mean to startle you. Izzy licked her lips and looked up again, the dizzying lights from the disco ball making her squint. Hey, Dr. Singh. Dr. Singh looked alien in the dark confines of the Blue Room bar. He wore the same thing that he'd worn to class that morning. Khakis, a brown leather belt that didn't match the darker leather of his shoes, a peach dress shirt. Izzy didn't know how to see him at the bar, with Jody smiling in the background. Is this uncomfortable for you? I can go sit somewhere else. Izzy shook her head and swallowed a giant gulp of her drink. No, not at all. I just usually don't see you here. She didn't know Dr. Singh well. She was in his Monday, Wednesday American history class, but she didn't even know where his office was. He was quiet, impersonal, yet polite with his students. I prefer to come here on Saturdays, he offered. Izzy liked his voice outside of the lecture hall. He sounded like an historian, his words carefully measured. I find that students prefer to go to campus parties on Saturdays. They leave the bar to the old men. That was exactly what Izzy and her friends did. Gay bar on Fridays, attempt at being a normal college kid at frat houses and rugby parties on Saturdays. So why Friday tonight? He glanced over and gave her a small, tired smile. Change of pace, I suppose. Izzy nodded, not sure what else there was to say. Do you come here very often? He cracked a smile, a warm, fatherly grin that made Izzy's drink turn in her stomach. Every week since I moved here in 97. He hadn't touched his beer yet, but he put a five down on the bar for Jody. How about you? She shrugged every week since I moved here a year ago. David Bowie's China Girl ended its first loop and there was a beat of silence. Glasses clinked together beneath the bar and laughter filtered in from across the room. Before they were forced to continue their conversation, Let's Dance began its steady drum beat, signaling that someone bought the entire album on the jukebox for the evening. Isabel, if I may ask, doc Dr. Singh began clearing his throat. Isn't there a nicer place you kids can go to dance, have fun? Izzy smirked. What, you mean this place isn't a riot? It's fine for people like me, he said, taking a tiny sip of beer. The foam gathered in his dark mustache before he wiped it off with his wrist. But you're also young. I've been here for almost two decades and nothing has changed except for the jukebox. What did they used to play? Izzy swiveled in her stool so she could face Dr. Singh. 
He glanced at her shyly, something humorous in his eyes. A little bit of everything. They never played the same song twice in a night. Izzy tried to imagine Dr. Singh 18 years younger, thinner, in newer clothes. Maybe he had nice hair that he gelled back instead of a bald spot. Did the faculty know? Were they allowed to know? Without asking, Jody slid another drink in front of her, but the orange juice color made Izzy nauseous. Do you want to dance, Dr. Singh? Dr. Singh sighed, still giving her that warm smile. You know you don't have to entertain me. We can exist perfectly fine together in the same room. I know, she said, standing up and offering him her hand. I just like this song. Dr. Singh was about to shake his head, Izzy could tell. But maybe he saw something in her that night, something restless, something on the edge of tears. She was sure he only danced with her so he wouldn't have to hear one of his students break down about their girlfriend troubles. She didn't mind that it was pity when he stood and rested his hand on her shoulder, letting her lead the way across the room. There were only four couples on the floor and a few pods of friends. Before Dr. Singh could protest, Izzy faced him head on and rested her arms up on his broad shoulders, lacing her fingers behind his neck. I honestly didn't think this was how I'd spend my evening, Dr. Singh said dryly, gazing around the room. They shuffled back and forth in slow rotations, keeping time to the tempo of the music. Do you have a husband, Dr. Singh? Izzy kept her eyes trained on the wrinkled collar of his shirt. Do you ever meet anyone here? I did, he said. He bumped into one of the dancing couples and muttered an apology. Have a husband, I mean, or a partner, as we called them. He died two years ago. What was his name? Izzy sniffled. Drinking always made her airy and cotton-headed, pulled her down like she was getting the flu. Carlos, he said, the name rolling off his tongue like poetry, like it was something he only said on special occasions. Izzy breathed deeply, the sharp alcohol taste in her mouth, replaced by Dr. Singh's cologne. You know, I was a Girl Scout when I was little. Yeah, Dr. Singh's voice was halting, constricted. Yeah, Izzy answered. We used to meet in a room like this. A sharp crackle spread over the sound system and everyone paused. It only lasted half a second, that break in the flow of bodies, like a computer glitch. But the music just didn't sound the same when it came back. Izzy rested her head on Dr. Singh's chest like she used to do with her stepdad when she was little and he'd take her to his office events as his date. And Dr. Singh's hands tightened on her waist for just a moment before releasing. I think, he said, that's enough dancing for tonight. And that is what I have for you today. I just want to congratulate our wonderful creative writers, DC Kroll, Stephanie uh, Wisdom, and Jess Rockman. And please, um, thank you all for coming, and please congratulate them yourselves.